Hello, and welcome to all the alumni, students, parents, and friends who are joining us for the inaugural Tufts Talks online. I'm Kaylan Taylor-Clark, a trustee of the university since 2016 and a proud double jumbo. It is truly an honor for me to be hosting this event and to be here with all of you and with our esteemed speakers and university leaders to bring you compelling examples of the breakthrough scholarship and research that make our university distinct and are making a positive impact in the world. For the past seven years, Tufts Talks has been a highly anticipated event on the Tufts calendar. And we wanted to make sure that we bring you a similar experience online that you have come to expect in person. Today, through brief presentations and interactive Q&A sessions, you'll learn about the world's diverse food systems, the effect the global pandemic has had on them, and how the choices you make impact every link in the food supply chain. You'll see strategies for improving and measuring the results organizations can achieve in tackling some of society's most challenging issues. And you'll hear about the many challenges facing st student voting in the US and what we're doing to address them. But first, I want to introduce you to our president, Tony Monaco. An accomplished leader, scientist, and teacher, Tony brings to the Tufts presidency deep-rooted commitments to academic excellence, diversity, access and inclusion, a global perspective, and a clear awareness of higher education's power to impact individuals and society. Tony has been working tirelessly alongside many others at Tufts to combat the global pandemic on multiple fronts and ensure a safe reopening of our campuses this fall. Please welcome Tony Monaco. Thank you, Kaylan. Greetings from the Tufts campus. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you, alumni, students, parents, friends from around the world to Tufts Talks. Tufts Talks is one of the university's premier annual events. This year, we are bringing Tufts Talks to you online for the first time. We have invited a wider audience than ever before, and we have an impressive lineup of speakers on topics that are sure to engage and enlighten. Before we introduce our speakers, I want to offer a brief update from The Hill. Over the past several months, I have been inspired by our community in many ways, by their creativity, their entrepreneurship, their compassion and commitment to justice. After having addressed last spring many challenges presented by the COVID-19 outbreak, everyone in Tufts rose to the occasion this summer. Our collective efforts have shown leadership among institutions of higher education. Our faculty and staff devised creative and innovative ways to keep our students and communities safe this fall. They also ensured that the experience of a Tufts education continues to be available for those that have worked hard to take advantage of it. We have also answered our community's call to ensure that Tufts is an anti-racist institution. Together, we are identifying the actions needed to increase access and opportunity at Tufts for Black, Indigenous, and all people of color. I am confident that we, we, we will become a stronger university as a result of our commitment to eliminating structural racism at Tufts. Thank you for your continued support of our efforts. And speaking of your support, these past several months have certainly been challenging and changed us in ways we have never before experienced nor imagined. Thanks to your unwavering generosity, we have been able to provide our students with the financial aid they need in these unprecedented times. After the crisis hit last spring, Tufts alumni, parents, and friends responded quickly, contributing more than $270,000 in hardship funds for students in need during the global pandemic. Your support enabled students to pay for unforeseen expenses last spring, expenses like plane tickets home and technology needed for remote learning, while providing funds to offset income from summer jobs lost to the pandemic. You have also extended aid to graduate students who have faced increased financial hardship during this time. 
With your support for fellowships and stipends, you have helped to give students who are pursuing advanced degrees the offer opportunity to begin and continue their studies at Tufts. Your generous investment in Tufts also enables the cutting edge research and scholarship which you are about to hear. You propel the university forward, making possible many achievements in so many disciplines. And the breadth of those achievements, as illustrated by the Tufts Tufts faculty, is what makes Tufts University a special place. And now, for the introduction of our speakers, we'll turn to Provost Nadine Aubrey. Thank you, Tony. It's my sincere pleasure to be with all of you today and to echo Tony's thanks for your support of our students and faculty and their research and scholarship. It's now my honor to introduce tonight's speakers and do what I love most, support and promote the outstanding work, thought leadership and active citizenship of our faculty. I will now introduce our speakers in order of appearance. Our first speaker is Professor Tim Griffin from the Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy. Tim received the inaugural professorship in nutrition, agriculture, and sustainable food systems at the Friedman School. He works on the assessment of sustainability across environmental, social, and economic metrics, regional food systems, and climate change impacts on agriculture. Tim hails from North Dakota and lived across the Midwest. He has worked for many years with farmers and ranchers, so he knows agriculture from the ground up. Tim will discuss the challenges facing the world's food systems and how innovation is essential to address our most pressing needs regarding health, sustainability, and the economic well-being of everyone involved. Our second speaker is Professor Alnur Ibrahim. Alnur is a professor of management at the Fletcher School and Tisch College. Alnur studies the transformation of today's social sector which calls for new models of management and systems of measurement. Alnu addresses the dilemmas faced by leaders of social enterprises and nonprofit organizations, what to measure, what kinds of performance systems to build, and how to align multiple demands for accountability. Our final speaker is Dr. Nancy Thomas, as director of the Institute for Democracy and Higher Education at Tisch College, Nancy conducts research on political learning and engagement in higher education. Nancy's aims are ambitious. She works to increase college and university student voting, advance student political learning, and improve student capacity to talk politics across difference and conflict, and close equity gaps in voting. Nancy will share insights from the Institute's signature initiative involving more than a thousand US colleges and universities and over 10 million students to every corner of the nation. And now I will turn this back to our host, Kaylan Taylor-Clark. Thank you very much, Tony and Nadine. Before we start, I want to give you an idea of what to expect. After each 10 minute talk, I will moderate a live Q&A session with the speaker, taking your questions in real time. During and after each talk, you will be able to write your questions in the chat box next to the video on the screen. While we can't get to everyone's questions, we will try to answer as many as possible. So let's get started. First up is Tim Griffin from the Friedman School. Tim was going to be joined today by two Friedman PhD students, Nyla Bezares and Silvia Berciano. Since neither could be here, I want to recognize the work they did to help prepare this presentation. Thank you, Nyla and Silvia, and welcome, Tim. We all have one thing in common, and that's that we all eat food. 
keeps us alive, kind of the biology of nutrition, keeps us healthy in many cases. One of the things that I really like to do is be able to cook food and serve food to people that I love. So for example, this is a, a plate of food I made at the Tufts campus in Telwar when we were there last year. One of the ways that we're different though, is it's very unlikely that you eat exactly the same foods as somebody else. They might be similar, for example, in your household or with your family or in a particular community, but around the world, we eat a lot of different ways. So there's this very personal side of food that often gets overlooked when we talk about diets and nutrition and even sustainability. And then you see headlines like this, the way that we eat is killing us and the planet. And this was a recent headline in The Guardian. There are also a lot of other headlines, including some scientific articles that, that really implicate some of the ways that we eat and a litany of chronic diseases from diabetes to cancer. So there's also this tension between this very personal aspect of food and eating and the implication to the planet. And that's because there are 7.2 billion of us people on the planet. So I have my plate of food for dinner, but the impact is much, much bigger than that. And this is because there are so many people, this is not a trivial kind of academic thing. It is one of the biggest footprints of humankind on the planet. I don't know if you're old enough to remember this poster. Uh, it was a very famous poster from April of 1970, so 50 years ago. And it was from the first Earth Day. And it says, we have met the enemy and he is us. And it was really about what we as the human population were doing to the environment, specifically around pollution. And around the same time as that, there was a pretty famous bumper sticker that said, think globally and act locally. And I think that's the way that we should be thinking about uh, our choices that we make about food. How does it impact us individually, which is a very local decision, but also the planet. So what I'm gonna talk about today is the linkage between these things. So here's the goal. Although I really think this is two goals. One is that we want healthy diets and specifically we want healthy diets for everybody around the world, regardless of income or where they live. And we want the food for those diets to come from a sustainable food system, which has a number of components. And we'll talk about a few of those in the next couple of minutes. So I come to this question or this issue of sustainability very much from the agriculture side. So this is not a um, random picture of a person in a tractor that I found on the internet. This is me. It was in one of my previous careers. So I spent nearly 30 summers doing this kind of work, uh, doing research that answered questions directly from farmers in the United States. And it was a real privilege because for most of that time, I also got to work directly with farmers. So the, the question of where does food come from is really something that I'm comfortable with because I've worked with many, many different types and sizes of farms across the United States. And this has really been the formative uh, piece of my professional life was the time that I spent being able to do this. And it influences the way that I approach my work, research and teaching at Tufts. Now, agriculture, as I mentioned earlier, has a big impact, but it also looks very different depending on where you are. It looks different in the way it works and it looks different in scale. So here's an example from Southeast Asia of a very small rice paddy. This rice paddy is maybe 50 feet by 100 feet. And working that to prepare it for planting takes two people that you can see that are working and a, and a fairly large oxen that's pulling a very small plow. So those characteristics about disturbing the soil, planting things are common, but the scale varies greatly. Here's another example. This is uh, in the Columbia River Basin. So this is in the Pacific Northwest of the United States. And each of those little green circles that you see is a half a mile across. So this is irrigated agriculture in a place that's actually very dry. The rainfall here is about eight inches per year. So the picture you're looking at might be 40 or 50 miles across. 
So obviously at a much bigger scale, and these are round irrigation systems, so the sprinkler goes around in a circle. And when you scale this up globally, as I mentioned earlier, this is the footprint of humankind in the way that we use land and water especially. So let's think about an example. Here's another food that I just love is, is pasta with homemade tomato sauce and sometimes homemade pasta, but, but not always, but the tomato sauce almost always is something that we make. Now, if it's the middle of winter here where I live in Massachusetts, then I'm probably gonna go to the grocery store. I'm probably not gonna buy fresh tomatoes. I'm probably gonna buy canned tomatoes, which we use a lot of. So when I do that, in all likelihood, the tomatoes in that can are coming from a very highly industrialized system, must, much of which is in California, but also in Florida. So the, the picture you see on the lower left has these two little red rectangles in it. Those are truckloads of tomatoes. So this is mechanical harvest. And the picture that you see actually only has three people in it those people are driving each of those pieces of equipment. So compare that scale to what we saw with the picture from Asia, where it was two people working a very small plot of land. Now, when I make my tomato sauce during the summer, in all likelihood, I'm either going to a local farmer's market or a community supported agriculture that I have a subscription to. And in most cases, getting tomatoes that look very different, like heirloom tomatoes. The scale of agriculture in that situation is much, much smaller. And I'm not pointing out that there's a, there's a good scale and a bad scale. There's just different scales and they have different implications. So you might be wondering what can you do or, or what are things that you should be thinking about if you're interested both in diets that are healthy, but also diets maybe that are better for the planet. And one of the things that you can think about is to start thinking about what are the parts of the system. So this beautiful location that's on this picture, this is in the High Atlas Mountains, so not too far outside of Marrakesh, Morocco. And we visited there in early 2019. And the reason that I use this picture is because it is about a community, but it, the community is embedded directly in the agriculture and the food system. So there's about 80 families that live here. They're relatively poor. They grow many, many crops, and then they actually meet as a community and decide which crops are grown by whom on which parts of the landscape. So for them, there's no division between the food system and their community that we see often in industrial countries. Another big impact that you can make is to start thinking and then acting to reduce the amount of food that gets wasted. In all different kinds of food systems around the world, the amount of food that gets wasted is somewhere around 30 to 40%, which means all of the resources that went into that food are essentially lost. So this takes some planning, but there are little things that can be done on the level of your household to try to reduce food waste. But you need to think about it and you need to take action with it. Globally, we need to think about technology and how it can both increase the amount of food available, which we are going to need, but also reduce the environmental impact of that food production. So for example, this is another big irrigation system. It doesn't go in a circle, it actually goes in a straight line. This is in South Central Nebraska. This is very appropriate technology for Nebraska, which has 8 million acres of irrigation. It's not appropriate technology if you're in Malawi in Sub-Saharan Africa. So when we talk about the availability of water and irrigation in different parts of the world, it means different things and we can't just transplant different technologies. You should also be thinking about the people in the food system. And, and this is the one place today that I'll mention the pandemic because the pandemic has shown a pretty harsh light on the way that we treat uh, some people in the food system. So the picture that you see here is uh, people picking lettuce in the Salinas Valley of California. So this is very, very difficult. Um, it's hot, uh, crowded. The people are right next to each other. So during the pandemic, people who work on farms um, people who work 
in, for example, uh, livestock slaughter and processing facilities have basically become hotspots for COVID-19. The other group in the food system that's been dramatically hit by the impact of the pandemic is people that work in restaurants. Again, often immigrant labor, low paid labor. So it has really shown a light on this issue of how we treat people and, and hopefully change will come from that. One of the increasing interests is also the way that we treat animals in the food system. So 10 or 15 years ago, it would be relatively unusual if you went into a grocery store and there would be some kind of rating system that would start to give you an indication of how animals are treated, whether they're chickens or cattle or, or dairy animals or whatever. This is becoming increasingly important for consumers and the reason that the system is adjusting to it is because we, the people who buy and eat food, are demanding that the system change. So, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions and speak up if there's parts of this that um, are troublesome to you in the food system. We do need to be thinking about all parts of the system. A lot of my comments today have been about agriculture, and that's partly because that's where I come from but the challenges and opportunities go through all parts of supply chains. And we, we really have this need to build a new food system and it needs to be one that works for everybody, both in terms of their nutrition, in terms of their food, but also in terms of the work that they do. So I'm really fortunate because at the Friedman School, I get to work with this tremendous group of idealistic young people that are the students um, that have that as their primary goal. And two examples are shown here. This is Nehela and Sylvia, who won the entrepreneurship contest at the Friedman School for developing an ice cream made from oats. So, they built into their model, not just does it taste good, but also how does a business like this treat people? And then there are the nutritional aspects of this. So it's a great kind of targeted uh, set of actions that incorporate all of these aspects of sustainability, which includes the people and it includes economics and businesses. So they're developing a suite of products from their company. This is another group of students that I had in a class where they got to develop a new product of their own. It happened to be pasta, which was fantastic. And then they got to do a pitch um, to the rest of the class. And I, and I bring this up because this, this is essentially what got me out of the tractor back some 12 years ago and moved to Boston was to be able to work with students that had this kind of ambition to make positive changes across the food system. And the, they are the people who can think clearly about what are the connections between the availability of food and for example, the way that we treat people in the food system. So as you go forward, you can't necessarily change all of your decisions all at once, but you can start to make small changes to be able to take action to improve what you think is important and it could be people, it could be animals, it could be livelihoods, but any of those are okay. So my parting word to you is think globally and act locally about your food. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. So happy to be here with you. And uh, there you are, hello. So nice to Thanks. see you. We're live on air. You. Well, thank you for joining us. And that was a wonderful talk. We appreciate, I really appreciated learning more about your work. Um, I did want to start with a question around the pandemic and how it's shown a harsh light on how we treat some people in the food system. Mm -hmm. uh, you gave the example of workers in meat processing and packing plants and people who work for low wages in restaurants. I guess the question is what can not just individuals do, but what would you say are one to two system changes that you think are going to have um, a probable impact on this, on this problem? 
this issue? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a great question, Caitlin. And a lot of those issues, those are not those are not new. They're just a lot more visible given the current circumstance in the world. And my comments in my talk were really about what do we as eaters, people who eat, that we're starting to think about that. But the grander scale solutions to this would involve the private sector. It, can you build those kinds of things into business models so that it's not just a driver that produces food at the lowest cost and then the most vulnerable people within the food system suffer because of that? The same would be true of governments and those governments here in the US, it could be multiple layers of government from municipalities to states to federal government, which could be around wages. It could be about safety in the workplace, whether that is in a processing plant or on a farm. So all of those things, and we think of systematic changes are gonna occur in all of those sectors and they need to. I don't see it necessarily being that uh, we can pass you know, three major laws and that's gonna fix and protect all of the people that are involved in the food system. Uh, I think it's, mu it's much broader than that. It is, it is government certainly, um, but private sector and then advocacy because in a lot of cases, that's what drives political change. And as I mentioned in my talk, when we as consumers speak up, it does change things if enough of us speak up. Thank you. That, that was really um, important. You Now we're getting a lot of questions from the audience and keep them coming audience. We're really happy to get your questions. Um, uh, but this actually came from one audience member and I think it's an interesting question. What role do you see food distribution companies playing in food equity and sustainability? I mean, the, the, the distribution of food, those companies can serve a lot of different roles. A lot of times we think if it's a very large distribution company, then they only buy food from, you know, larger farms or other businesses that are large. And that's not necessarily the case. There are some models out there where they can, uh, they can serve the function, but actually capture a much broader range of agriculture which also allows us to have more different types of, for example, from my experience, farming operations and people who run those farms involved. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's, I think there are roles that could be very specific to, to distribution so that it doesn't necessarily mean that everything is big. It might be that they're playing a certain function. And once you get across scales of businesses and scales of farms, you're involving a much broader range of, of diversity among the people that are involved. So I think there is a role there for, in this example, specifically distribution companies. The same would be true of processors or retailers or what have you. Yeah, interesting. So I actually, I'm looking through this chat and it's it's we've got a lot of questions here. There's some questions, Tim, around what we should be eating. Um, and I'm going to actually ask, there's probably four or five here, but let me ask this one. It's a good one. Um, we've heard so much about, you know, how meat and specifically cows emitting carbon dioxide denigrate the environment. Should yeah. people eliminate beef from their diets or are there certain foods that we should just be absolutely eliminating not only for our individual health, but for the health of the environment and the globe more broadly? Yes, I've gotten this question before, Kaylon. Uh, I, I don't, I, I don't, I don't see it as being that, you know, like for us, those of us who do research on the food system or we do research on nutrition to say that everybody should behave in a very particular way. My, my point really, and, and one of my goals, whether it's in research or reaching out to the public is to get people to think about the choices that they're making. And, and it, but there's also this factor of, you know, if, if American diets are not particularly healthy right now, which all of the nutrition and health data would illustrate that they're not particularly healthy. So what are changes that we make? So that, that's, a, that's a piece of it. But to, to say you should be doing those things for one particular reason, I don't find that to be very realistic. And, and then there's the, 
one of the concerns I have is about what's the pathway to change? So if you, mm -hmm. if somebody says, let's not eat any beef or let's not eat any dairy or let's not eat any strawberries, you know, whatever it is, the, the, one of the points I made in my talk is like, there are people involved in this system, right? That, that are in all parts of that supply chain. And we need to be thinking about what is the impact of those kinds of decisions on the people that do this. It's not only livelihoods, it's culture. It's like, this is what they and their family have been doing for generations. And then to say, no, we should just do away with that. You know, I, we, we should always admit our biases, right? Absolutely. I always think about like all of the people that I've worked with who are farmers and ranchers and I have to respect what they do, but we can still make change in that and we should be having those conversations. So I'm not, I'm not saying that everybody should eat in a certain way, but please be thinking about what you're eating for multiple reasons. Yes. And that's why you're here for us. Thank you, Tim. I have another, just one other question actually came out, uh, you know, from a, not just a US centric context. Um, one person writes, I saw Denmark highlighted recently for growing crops indoors and in very small amounts of land with incredibly high yields. Could that work here? It, it does work here to some extent already. So we do, I mean, the, the United States is really big physically. Denmark, much less so, and the Netherlands, much re less so. They have been very, very successful at growing a huge amount of food in a very controlled environment. So you can't look at that and say, that's not industrialized. It absolutely is, but very low environmental impact. But the crops that they're growing, so if you go to the Netherlands, for example, they grow a lot of bell peppers in the Netherlands or tomatoes. When we go outside, and be able to be like, we're not gonna grow wheat in a greenhouse or a glass house, right? So the staple grains that take millions or tens of millions of acres, they're, they're gonna continue to be outside, but we could make, I mean, I love the idea of making better use of technology and ecology at the same time, so that we can solve some of those things and produce healthy food. So I don't see those as being contrasting. I see them as being synergistic. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another question has come up here. Uh, it's become increasingly important to consumers to know how animals have been treated in the food production process. This information has become more transparent because we as consumers have demanded it. Should we be demanding the same level of transparency about how the people who work on farms or meatpacking plants are treated? Is there is there any way that we can be more, more yeah, yeah the, 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 absolutely. The short answer the, on should we be demanding that and exploring what are the options for how food is produced and how those people are treated within it, then 100%, absolutely, we should be demanding that. And it does, you know, a lot of change is incremental, but I think that, you know, that we as people who eat food, we have one we have some responsibility because we're the demand right we are generating the demand but we should also be thinking about what are the not just like where if, if you can afford to buy food it's not just about which products am i buying and which grocery store do i go to where i live it's to begin to think about what are all of the other implications that i think that's my overriding message is you don't have to think about everything at once, but be conscious about we impact the planet, we impact people, we impact animals, all of those things. Thank you so much, Tim. I want to just you. ask you in the 30 seconds that we have left, what's next for you? Well, I mean, this, this area of research, I've been involved in sustainable agriculture and sustainability for since the 80s. A, that will continue. I work with a lot of students on research on this, doctoral students, master's students. And then my other interest, as I mentioned at the end of my talk, is, is continuing to help that next generation that can help us address these challenges. We need those people in the room that understand what these connections are. And that's my mission right now. 
That's wonderful. And Tim, thank you for your mission and thank you for everything that you're doing uh, for our students uh, and for our university. Wonderful being with you tonight. Thank you. Thanks, Kaylin. Our next speaker is Alnor Ibrahim from the Fletcher School and Tisch College. Alnor. I'm delighted to be with you and to have a chance to speak to you about my work on measuring social change. As we begin, I'd like you to put in your mind a key global challenge that you care about. Could be climate change, could be global health pandemics, global poverty, racial justice and inequality. Pick one in your mind. Now imagine an organization that's actually trying to address this problem. It could be an organization, a nonprofit to which you've donated money. It could be a business with a social purpose. It could be a government agency whose work you follow. Now put yourself in the shoes of a manager or a leader within that organization. How will you understand whether you're actually delivering on the results that you're seeking to achieve? How will you measure and improve that progress? This turns out to be one of the most difficult challenges facing social change leaders. And it's the purpose of my new book, Measuring Social Change, which came out last year, and we're gonna have a Spanish version coming out in the fall. The central question that many managers of social change organizations ask is, how do we know if we're making a difference? And their funders ask the same question. How do they know if they're making a difference? So whether you are an advocacy organization, like the top image on this slide, um, advocating for the rights of marginalized groups, or if you're a soup kitchen serving meals to the homeless, or a food systems organization working with smallholder farmers, it's the same question that you have to ask as a manager or as a funder. The stakes are high. So just in the US alone, nonprofit organizations generate about $2 trillion of revenue on an annual basis. And in the business world, the impact investing community, which is about 10 years old, has already generated about half a trillion dollars of assets under management, which is growing rapidly. But even these kinds of figures are not enough to address our social challenges. According to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, we're seeing a shortfall of about $3 trillion annually in terms of the resources needed to actually address big social sustainable development challenges like ending poverty or hunger or creating gender equality. So for organizations to generate the resources, to generate trust in society to provide those resources, and to measure progress, the challenge for managers is to actually develop clear strategies for social change. In my work, I identify three foundational questions that any manager or leader must ask. The questions will seem obvious to you, but the answers turn out to be more difficult to produce. So the first one, most obviously, is what is it that we're trying to achieve? And the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche is known to have said, the most common form of human stupidity is forgetting what we were trying to accomplish. We get so caught up in the day to day that we lose sight of the big goals and actually measuring progress towards those. In the language of management, that's your value proposition. We need to be clear about what we're trying to achieve and for whom we're trying to achieve those goals. The second foundational question that any manager must address is how will we bring about that change? In the language of social change management, that's your social change model. And we have a whole set of tools and methods that can help us to achieve an answer to this question. And then third, there's this question of how will we hold our feet to the fire? This is the issue of accountability in terms of delivering on that value proposition. So any leader of a social change organization must be very clear about these, the answers to these three questions. And in turn, their teams, their staff, their constituents must be aligned around those answers. In my research, I found, however, that 
Even if you're clear about the answers to these three questions, you still need to do a lot more work in terms of developing a clear strategy, how you will actually go about delivering that change. And I've identified four key types of strategy that I think are pretty comprehensive in terms of the options facing managers. So I'm going to list for you the four types of strategies. I'm not going to have time to go into all of them, so I'm going to focus on two of them. There's a niche strategy where you deliver a key service with high quality, such as meals in a soup kitchen. There's an integrated strategy where you line up a whole set of interventions. So in a food system, if you're working with smallholder farmers, you might line up access to credit and fertilizers with irrigation, with access to markets, in order to then increase farmer incomes. In an emergent strategy, which I find is very common among advocacy organizations, you have to take stock of the political environment and constantly adapt your strategy, your approach, in order to be able to move the needle on the policy problem you're addressing. And that changes rapidly over time, so you need to be nimble and agile. And finally, in an ecosystem strategy, you might decide that actually addressing the problem requires partnership, coordination, among a whole range of organizations working together. So the soup kitchen by itself can't address the problem of homelessness, it needs to work with a whole bunch of others. So I want to spend a few minutes talking about these two strategies, the niche and the ecosystem, with a focus on one organization to illustrate it. That organization is called Miriam's Kitchen. It works with the homeless and it's based in Washington, DC. Now Miriam's Kitchen initially started off with a niche strategy, which is perfectly appropriate for the kind of emergency service work that it was doing. It was providing highly focused services, meals, clothing, transportation to other facilities, connection to organizations that could provide shelter. And it was doing this with high quality. Now, if you're a leader in such an organization, what could you reasonably measure and take credit for? It turns out that all you can actually take credit for is short-term results or outputs, the number of people fed or sheltered and so on. In some instances, that's perfectly appropriate. But in other instances, you might ask the question, well, is this enough to address the problem that you're after? About a dozen years ago, Malcolm Gladwell wrote a piece, an article in the New Yorker magazine, which he was following a man, a homeless individual that he called Murray. He asked the question, what is the cost to society of keeping Murray in the condition that he's in? We're not really getting him out of homelessness. Is there a cost to us? And if you tally these up, the emergency room visits, the interactions with the police, the emergency shelter, Murray was costing society about $100,000 a year, or about a million over a decade, hence the name Million Dollar Murray. And so one has to ask the question, is there a better way? We're spending all of this money, and in the end, Murray is no better off than he was before. Well, it turns out, yes, there's a better way for actually a lot less money, a lot less cost to society. It requires a fundamental shift in our thinking from a niche strategy, which takes the client, Murray in this instance, provides all of these services, but Murray has, has, is left to kind of figure out which ones to pursue and how to find those services. Those are niche services. They're not coordinated in a way that actually helps him. But could we move to an ecosystem strategy for addressing this problem in a much more orchestrated, integrated kind of way? Turns out there's a solution. It's called Housing First. It was pioneered by an organization called Pathways to Housing in New York City. And the idea is you take the most vulnerable people like Murray, you put them in housing, and then you wrap all of these services around them so they can be customized to the needs of that individual. It sounds expensive, but it turns out to be a lot cheaper than the atomized niche services way in which this work was previously done. If you're a manager or a funder, what could you measure now in terms of progress? Well, you'd measure those individual services. Are they provided effectively, efficiently? But now you can actually get at the collective result, the collective outcome of actually getting people out of chronic homelessness. 
And this, this uh, more ecosystem-oriented strategy turns out to be twice as effective as a niche orientation. It turns out that this framing, niche strategies and ecosystem strategies, apply to all sorts of other types of problems. So addressing the coordination problems in a global health pandemic requires us to actually work together and coordinate it as an ecosystem rather than acting alone. Addressing climate change requires an ecosystem strategy. Addressing poverty requires an ecosystem strategy. So you might ask why we don't actually see more of such types of efforts. That's a topic for a much longer conversation, but two of the key reasons are, A, this requires particular skills of negotiation, conflict resolution, working together, rather than trying to take credit for separate work that we do alone. And B, it's actually a lot harder to raise funding for this kind of work because nobody can take credit for the results on their own. So to begin to wrap up, in my book I lay out four different types of strategies that social change leaders can pursue. And I've talked about two of them briefly, the niche and the ecosystem strategies. But it's possible to be high performing in any of these four strategies. And as a manager, you've got to choose because that then affects what you can reasonably measure and be held to account for, and the kinds of performance management systems that you might build. In closing, I'd like to say a few words about what's happening at Tufts in this space. Tufts University is a leader on social change work, and particularly at the ecosystem strategy level. So just in the past year, there's been a whole set of convenings. Fletcher had a convening on the Arctic, so just think about the challenges confronting us in the Arctic, climate change, navigable waters, um, geopolitics, access to natural resources, and so on. In addition, there's another whole group at Fletcher that's working on the digital economy and asking the question, what would a digital economy look like if it were inclusive, if it were actually benefiting everybody in society? But what makes me most proud is the work of our students. So the three logos that you see at the bottom of this screen are startup organizations that were founded by Tufts students who graduated last year. All of them took a class with me where we developed strategies for their organizations. And I want to close with an email I received from the founder of the first of these, Sustag for All, which is a sustainable agriculture organization working with smallholder farmers uh, on food systems in Colombia. And the founder of that organization is Luis Villegas. He graduated last year, and he sent me an email a few weeks ago as I was preparing for this talk. And he wrote to me, the 1,000 avocado trees are planted and are looking in great shape. The seedlings facility will sell the first 40,000 seedlings by the end of the year 2020. Last year, I attended the Climate Action Summit at the UN headquarters representing the Fletcher School. Among so many high-level meetings and networking, I had the chance to present Sustag for All to the Secretary General and asked him to include us as one of the projects in the Year of Action on the Global Commission on Adaptation. Sustag for All represents what the Fletcher community, and I might add Tufts University, pursues. We are being seen as an example for Fletcher and Friedman School entrepreneurs of the way to make big changes. It has a huge value for it's something to feel proud of. Now that makes me proud to be a part of Tufts University. Thank you. How wonderful. Thank you so much, Alnor, for that wonderful presentation. So happy to be with you, you almost much. live, almost together. Um, so thank it's you, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so I do have a quick question. The questions are coming in and everyone keep them soaring in. We're, we're blowing through them very quickly here, but I wanted to start very quick, briefly with the question to you, Alnor, about strategy. I'm very interested, as you know. Um, you've told us that an ecosystem strategy, although expensive to put in place, is twice as effective as a niche strategy would be. However, we don't see more of these types of efforts because A, it requires particular skills in negotiation, as you mentioned, and conflict resolution and working together. Um, but B, it's a harder to raise funding for these types of organizations 
because nobody can take credit for the results on their own. Um, you say this is a topic for a much larger conversation, but can you give us one example of, of that and, and what that would look like and how we might overcome those challenges? Yes, of course. Um, so the, the homeless example that I gave um, in the talk, this is national. So it's not just Miriam's Kitchen in Washington, D.C., but there are literally hundreds of cities experimenting with this model. And in some cases, city level government, municipal governments have stepped up and are taking the lead on this. And so in some cases, it's nonprofits, in some cases, it's city government. But the whole idea is you can't just have a soup kitchen trying to address homelessness. You have to get the soup kitchen with the substance abuse counseling folks, with the healthcare folks, with the employment folks, all working together. And you need some sort of coordination mechanism for doing that. But if I can give another example, um, we're just later this week, actually on, on Thursday and Friday of this week, we're convening at Tufts at the Tisch College, a group of community foundation leaders. Um, and a, about four of them are gonna be talking about their works, um, their efforts to address racial justice and inequality in their communities. So the Greater Buffalo Community Foundation, uh, Dubuque, uh, San Francisco, um, you know, Greater Flint with the water crisis, really using these opportunities to say, here's a community foundation that's embedded in the community. It's got networks upwards with all of its funders, and it's got networks laterally and downwards with communities, with nonprofits, and it can actually serve as a hub for coordinating, for getting people to do joint action, to pick one or two big problems and to give it everything that they've got. And so imagine in this country, we've got about 800 community foundations. If they were all doing this kind of work, we would have incredible results on moving the needle on big social problems. Well, it's amazing, Elmore, that you say this because it feels like Tufts and the, through the work specifically that you're doing is helping to sort of incent even some of these, what we might call niche organizations to really come together. I mean, I guess that was one of the questions that has been coming up both through the chats and please everyone continue to ask your questions. Um, but one of the questions is how can we get or how do we incent these sort of niche organizations to take on these ecosystem strategies? You know, how do we actually bring them together? I recognize Tufts as a convener, but are there other ways to do that? Yes, indeed. And I think, I think communities are willing to come together if they can agree on a problem that they want to solve. And so the convener role, the honest broker role can be partly about saying, look, as a community, what is one or two challenges we want to address? And then who would we have to line up in order to be able to do this? So this can be played by nonprofits. Businesses, I think, have a huge role here. So the sustainable development goals, ending hunger, ending poverty, ending gender inequality, um, none of this is going to happen without a major role for business. So we need business to step up. And Tim mentioned this earlier in his comments to say, you know, I might be a soft drink maker, um, you know, or a maker of uh, electronics, but I actually want to contribute to my community and to build goodwill in my community. I can bring resources to the table. Who else is willing to come and work on an issue that we care about, whether it's human rights, gender rights, clean water, such as the work of the Community Foundation in Flint or so on. Great, thank you. Actually, I'm just getting another one. I'm trying to flush through all these questions. It's great, keep them coming folks. But there, here's one uh, that came from an audience member. Systemic is, systemic I should say, is a buzzword that's increasingly used in the impact world. How can managers incorporate strategies to measure systemic issues? Yes, this is a really good question and a very difficult one. So the, yeah. the problem is not in measuring progress on the problem. So let's say that you want to end urban poverty or you want to close the racial achievement gap. That's actually pretty measurable. Or you actually want nobody to get sick from the COVID pandemic. This is measurable. We can, we can measure all of these things. And in fact, you know, the CDC measures sort of you know, rates with respect to the pandemic, um, homelessness and so on. So actually seeing whether the needle is moving on the problem or not is not the problem. The problem, the challenge is getting everybody to have a coordinated strategy for it. And so what's hard about that is 
everybody wants to do their bit and they take credit for solving the problem, but it doesn't work that way. We need to actually work together and give credit to one another for actually solving the problem. So if we can take ego out of it and say, here's what we can bring to the table to contribute, then we might actually be able to make progress on this. I do think that the pandemic has made very clear that governments have a huge role to play here in terms of taking the separate atomized actions of different cities, different communities, different organizations and saying, no, we can help to coordinate this work. We can bring resources to bear to coordinate this work because only then will we see actually a decline in rates of illness from the pandemic. Very important point, you know, that the import of both private sector, but also government and really solving some of these issues. Thank you. You know, we've gotten a couple of questions around this niche strategy and you know, the idea that, yes, the ecosystem strategy is where we want to go. Um, but there have been a couple of questions, so I'm going to morph them a little bit, if I may. Um, let me just say it this way. Many organizations, they're saying, are hitting a wall, if you say. Um, when attempting to assess their impact on the larger scale societal issues, as we've described, which is why you really wanted to bring that ecosystem strategy to bear. But one, you know, how do we suggest that those niche organizations get over that as individual organizations? And two, are there still organizations that are better served by continuing to use niche strategy um, in the way that they approach their work? Yes, um, thank you for that question. It's a very astute one. And so I'm not suggesting that all organizations move to an ecosystem strategy. The four strategies that I outlined in the book, um, I think each of them one can be high performing in. But you have to be clear about what you're trying to achieve. If you're trying to end homelessness, a soup kitchen won't do it. Um, you know, if you're trying to solve the pandemic, just working on getting people to wear face masks is not going to do it. It's a key ingredient but by itself is not sufficient. On the other hand, there are certain niches that we feel actually you should stay focused on and do well. So for example, take you know, ambulance services. Um, you know, God forbid, because there's 800 people sort of watching this conversation between us, right? If I had a cardiac event, right? My heart starts beating faster um, and I fall to the floor. My wife who's in the room below me will hear a thump She's gonna come running up, she's gonna call 911. My chances of survival are much, much higher if the ambulance responds and administers care within nine to 12 minutes. If they respond in a half hour, my chances are very slim. What would we expect that ambulance service to measure? It would be unreasonable, it would be crazy to expect them to measure my health outcome because they're gonna pick me up, they'll administer emergency care, they'll take me to the hospital, and you know this as somebody that's in the health field yourself. What Absolutely. we expect the ambulance service to measure is response time and quality of care delivered en route. Those are short-term measures. That's a niche service. We don't want the ambulance service to be doing 10 different things or coordinating 10 different things. We want them to be doing a focused task, highly focused that they can deliver with high quality. That's a niche service, it has real value. Another example is, you know, if you've been through sort of the standard American education system, you've gone from daycare um, or preschool slash daycare to elementary school, to middle school, to high school, and perhaps to vocational or college. Um, each of these is a niche. So Tufts University is a niche. And there's a handoff across these. And we've got, a, for most, actually for not for most, for some people, there's a pretty good handoff that enables you to move through these niches so that you actually got an ecosystem that's working. But that system is failing a lot of people, right? People that don't have somebody that can help them um, make use of their preschool and elementary school, or people that have guidance counselors that can help them make the transition, or don't have the resources to make the transition. So an organization like Harlem Children's Zone in New York City actually thinks about that entire pipeline, that entire continuum, and tries to provide services along the way so that people don't fall through the cracks. They're saying that that educational system works for some part of our society, but for a lot of folks in those 100 city blocks in Harlem, it's not working. So we actually need a much more integrated strategy for those. 
Well, Elmer, I will say, and Dr. Ibrahim, I should say, I will say uh, your work is so powerful and I appreciate so much the time that you've taken this evening to share it with us. I know that the work that you'll be doing this weekend to bring together the community foundations will be incredibly successful. And I look forward to hearing how that goes, especially when it comes to racial equity. So thank you so very much, Dr. Ibrahim. Thank you, Kayla. Next, our final presenter is Nancy Thomas from the Institute for Democracy and Higher Education at Tisch College. Nancy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm excited to be here to talk about the state of American democracy and what Tufts University is doing to try to make our democracy work a little bit better. So over the years, I've gone to academic conferences and I always ask a series of questions about what academics think of is the current state of American democracy? Is it working well? Is it in a lull or is it in a steep decline? And while most people felt that it was in a steep decline, they also didn't view it as their job description to help democracy not decline. And I will say that over the years that's changed. While I used to ask that question and got no hands for, yes, it's our responsibility. Now, when I talk to audiences, academic audiences, they almost uniformly say, yes, it is our responsibility. Now, why are they doing that? They're doing that because our doc democracy is in trouble. There are multiple books on what is how democracies die. We have seen democracies die globally, and we need to be careful that that doesn't happen here. Our democracy is in decline because we have declining trust. We have increased polarization. We aren't getting along together. It's not just our elected officials. It's that we no longer have trust in each other to do the right thing as citizens in this country. And when I use the term citizen, I'm not talking about in the legalistic sense. It's people in this country. Also, you should know that our voting rates are among the lowest of established democracies that we are ranked 26 out of 32 established democracies in this country. Too few Americans vote. Now, part of that is because our voting systems are very decentralized. Each state has its own set of rules. And what that means is that it's confusing, it's, it's inconvenient, and it's inconsistent. And these days, there's also a lot of voter suppression. So our democracy isn't doing very well. Fortunately, our educators think that it's their job to do something about it as I do. So I run the Institute for Democracy in Higher Education here at Tufts University. We are an applied research shop. That means that we don't just study things. We are pretty activist about what we study. And I will tell you that we work, we catalyze change through pretty much five approaches. One is that we tell campuses their voting data and we, we do national studies on college student voting. I'll talk more about that in a minute. We're working on shifting campus climates. You know, voting is a social act. It's a matter of what's in your community, what's in your water. Well, that applies to campuses too. We're closing political equity gaps. As you all know, I'm sure that not all people have access to voting. Not all people are equally represented by our political system, and we're working to change that. We are elevating the discourse. We are trying to break down polarization and help academics teach their students to talk to each other. And finally, we're talking a lot about the future and health of democracy and how higher education can shape that future. I mentioned voting. We use we study voting through our national study of learning voting engagement. This is uh, affectionately referred to as NSOLV. NSOLV is a big study. It started out pretty small, but it has grown significantly. Uh, we now have 1,100 co colleges and universities participating in the study. And what that's done is give us a database of 10 million college student records for each of the past four federal elections, 2012, 14, 16, and 18. Now, 10 million, it's not just a good sample. It's more than half of the college students in this country. College students are a large group. They're a growing group. They're a more diverse group than they've ever been in the past, and they are a formidable voting block. So that's what we study with uh, through NSOLV. 
You might be interested to know some of the national data. I'm not going to go through all of it, but here's some highlights and maybe something that will give you a sense of optimism about the 2020 election. So in 2014, too few students voted. 13% uh, of 18 to 24 year olds voted on college campuses in the 2014 midterm election. And in 2018, that number more than doubled. College student voting rates went up 21 percentage points. That was higher than the increase among all Americans. Uh, some of the things that we've, we have realized from our research is that college students are registered to vote. They have been pretty consistently, but the real challenge is getting over that, the hurdles that they face so that they actually can vote. Too few students who are registered follow through, 53% um, barely more than half in 2018. But the good news is that students were activists, they were informed, and they were excited to vote. Some of the other things, interesting things that we learned, library science majors, educators, they have the highest voting rates on college campuses. And so do black women. Black women are the most consistently reliable student voters. We also find that STEM majors vote at lower voting rates than, than the highest, but bear in mind that it's because the high are super high. It's not necessarily that STEM are terribly low. And finally, we finding, we're finding that the gaps between different demographic groups of students are closing. Okay, so what do campuses do with their voting reports? We send them these reports. They are about eight pages. They're loaded with data, including field of study, age, uh, different demographic groups. And what they can do is they can share them across campus. They can talk about their numbers. They can isolate certain categories of students who might not be voting. They can um, certainly give the reports to faculty to energize them, if you will, uh, to get them more involved. And I want to show you this tape very quickly. It's um, students at the University of Texas, Austin, on what has now become known as NSOL Day on college campuses. Okay, Maya, what was your goal? Okay, so my personal goal was to be go from 18% to 35%. Okay. I'm going to download this document and open it. Oh my god, I'm so excited. My heart's beating so fast. Four point eight. <laughs> oh my gosh! I was just saying that word. So what happened at Tufts University? I'm just going to share with you the 2018 data. At Tufts University, 44 percent of the college students voted. That's four percentage points higher than the average, but it could be a little bit higher. It's still pretty good. The rate jumped 25 percentage points higher than the 21 percentage points that I mentioned earlier, and 55 percent of the registered students turned out to vote. Once again, Tufts is higher than the national averages. There's always room for improvement. All right, so what are we doing now? What, is, what are we doing? I have to tell you that when we first put together these slides, which was er much earlier in the year, and when I would talk to various academic groups, I was telling them not to worry about 2020, that I thought that the tra trajectory of college student voting had jumped so much and that the energy levels were so high that we weren't really gonna face a problem in 2020. I was telling them to focus on 2022, to use 2020 to establish activities and habits and campus climates that would then carry them to the next midterm election. But then COVID hit. And when COVID hit, a lot of things around voting changed. The big one is that students are not together right now. They're physically distanced. And as I mentioned, voting is a social act. Students vote because their friends vote. They go together to the polling locations. They work together to mobilize voters. It's an act of leadership, but it's collaborative leadership. So what happens now when campuses are remote? This has been a serious problem on campuses across the country. And so what is happening is that a lot of other constituencies on campus are needing to act at um, greater rates to support the students as they mobilize each other for voting remotely using social media. 
One constituency that we're focusing on are college and university presidents. They're busy. They're drinking out of a fire hose right now with all sorts of decisions around their finances and COVID and the safety of their students. So we were really surprised last week when we sent them an email with some voting data and more than 75% opened that email. That tells you that they are focused. They are also concerned about the state of this election and interested in energizing their students. So one of the things that we've asked of presidents to do is we've asked them to get involved in preserving their students' civil rights to vote, to check the voting conditions in their state, and to work to make sure that students are not deprived of their voting rights. That's a big ask for of college presidents, and yet that's what we're doing. We're also asking faculty to step it up. Faculty are the most consistent and direct communicators with students right now. And so what we want them to do is provide students with information about the mechanics of voting, what we call nudging, little mini reminders at the beginning of each class. But we also want them to talk politics talk politics in the classroom, talk politics with, with their students outside of class. And that's not so easy to do, again, in these polarized times. So we're providing faculty with a lot of resources on how to do that, how to manage uh, the tensions, how to manage conflict. And those things are going a long way for faculty to embed into their classes these political discussions. And by the way, we want that across disciplines. Every single discipline has a public relevance, not just the usual suspects that you might imagine, not just, uh, for example, political science or other social sciences. Getting back to the big picture that I raised at the beginning, what we're really working on is restoring higher education's historic mission. We all know that higher education's role is to educate for careers and economic security of the country, but that's not a complete picture of the job. The job also involves educating citizens for the future and health of this democracy so that they know their rights, but they also know their collective responsibilities so that they know that they are they have um, individual freedoms, but that they are also part of a community. This is the appropriate role of higher education. We're using voting as a way to get their attention, but it's not all they have to do. And that's what we're focused on. Thank you. That was wonderful, Nancy. Thank you so very much for that presentation. Now you're joining me virtually, live. Hi. Hi, how are you? So nice to be very here. Very well. So, so happy to have you and thank you for being here. That was a great presentation and very energizing, especially for the students that are out there watching right now. Um, you know, so I wanted to actually just jump in right away and ask you the question about the differences in library sciences. And, um, you know, you found that library science and education majors and Black women, I'm just saying, are the most <laughs> consistent voters, <laughs> and they vote at rates 15 percentage points higher than STEM and business majors. And I'm just very curious about your perspective of what accounts for this. <laughs> well, it's such a good question, and thanks for asking it. Uh, you know, there are lots of reasons why people vote and lots of reasons why they choose not to vote. So sorting through all that is a little bit a little bit different, uh, you know, a little bit difficult. I have to confess, for example, that uh, bad weather is a deterrent to voting. You know, people um, at the University of Michigan, I learned today that they're handing out hand warmers for students to go vote. So, you know, you have to take little things into consideration. But when it comes to a uh, field of study, I think it's about it's about this climate issue. It's about what's in the water in these departments. It's about what do they talk about in the classroom? And I think there's a little bit of gender bias going on with those numbers. Women do vote at higher rates than men. And when they dominate a, a field of study, the voting rates are going to be a little bit higher but that doesn't account for very many percentage points. It's really about what do educators and library science majors talk about? And they talk about so society. They talk about the big picture issues. They, it, it is a learning agenda. And of course, we all know that Thomas Jefferson and a lot of the founders founded a public university and felt that 
our democracy was only as strong as our public education system. So that those two that is important to library sciences and to education majors. So November third is coming up. Elections are coming up. Um, and you know we're all really curious, and I think these are the biggest questions that are coming in through the chat now. And keep your questions coming, folks. Um, but what can universities do in the next few days? Do you think to ensure that oh, students yeah. are able to vote and that their votes are counted? What 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 are some things that we could do? Oh, lots. I should say. There are lots of things that can be done. And in fact, last week we published a memorandum to campuses saying there's still time, <laughs> okay? So there are a lot of things they can do. Number one, you can find out whether your students are registered to vote. And this is, again, something that faculty can do in the classroom. They can put up a little slide and it can have a link to a location where students can check their registration. And that slide can be sitting there as the students enter the remote classroom. And while they're sitting down, they just push that, push that slide and then they are taken to a website where they can put in their name and their zip code and they will see whether they are registered. If students are not registered, it is too late in some states, but not all states. Many states have same day voter registration and voting, and that is an important, a very important uh, reform that I think we need nationwide. Um, we can also, we can also prepare our students for the issues. Talk to them about what are the positions. Um, talk to them about what's at stake. We have lots of guides on our website and we're directing other people to other people's websites where there are pro-con discussions. You know, what are the pros? What are the candidate positions? What is at stake when it comes to the environment? What's at stake when it comes to um, a whole lot of students care about issues deeply these days, and they are very activists. And uh, as a result, what we need to be doing is talking about the issues they care about. Surprisingly, they are the same issues that everybody cares about. They want to know, are they, is the economy strong? Are they going to be able to get jobs? Uh, can they afford the rest of their college? But they also, and of course, the environment. They are also deeply immersed in the equity work with Black Lives Matter and the 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 uh, the very volatile situation that we're seeing around um, the treatment of peaceful protesters. This is something that is uh, really very high in on the minds of college students. So at issue activism, talking about those issues. Um, we're also asking uh, professors to start thinking about the morning after and how they're going to talk about the election. This was something that did not happen in 2016. We put out all sorts of memos saying you're not ready for 2016. Um, and so this time around, I think campuses are thinking more about it, but they're trying to figure out what to do. And one thing that students don't appreciate is when they walk into a classroom uh, after an election day or after a very big public event, and they are met with radio silence. So mm. professors need to carve out space for these conversations. Um, those are just some of the many things that we're asking campuses to do. You know, and, and this gets to another, there are several questions coming through here. Um, and so I wanted to actually get to another one, which came up a couple of times around voter suppression. You know, we talk about voter suppression more broadly in the American politic and, and the electorate, um, but are there particular elements of voter suppression that apply to college students? You know, it hadn't occurred to me until I saw this question, but of course there must be. I, I'm curious what, what you're seeing. Absolutely. And it, it, frankly, it's getting worse. You know, there used to be a sort of a, a feeling that college students didn't vote, so why bother? And yet now I think that uh, that has changed and we see this big jump in 2018 and with the big jump in 2018 comes a big acts of voter suppression. Um, there are, there are, there's one thing that you need to understand and that is that our nation's voting systems are very complicated, inconsistent, constantly changing. There are hundreds of lawsuits pending right now 
around voting conditions and how votes are going to be counted, when the deadlines are. These are pending right now. Aren't we one week away from the election? And there are some campuses that aren't even really sure what the rules are going to be. So what happens when you have a lot of confusion is it suppresses the vote. When you add to that mix uh, a high level of inconvenience, it suppresses the vote. So just let's take, for example, student IDs. There are some states where you don't even need an ID. You can just walk in and vote. And then there are other states that have very strict identification requirements. Bear in mind that for college students, they don't just need to prove their identity. Like I go to vote and I just have to prove I'm Nancy Thomas and here's my driver's license and I live here. Students have a dual burden of proof. They have to prove their identity and they also, in many cases, have to pr prove that they have the right to vote there. And so this issue of residency is highly controversial and um, more and more states are finding it as a way that they can suppress the vote. Um, we're working with um, various organizations. We convened uh, the Fair Election Center, uh, the ACLU, the Lawyers Committee. We've been taking a, a, systematic, a systemic approach to it and trying to get people together. And we issued a memorandum on the barriers to voting and ways to overcome those barriers. And voter suppression is, there's a very fine line between extreme inconvenience and voter suppression. Yeah, very, very true and very important to understand. In the last minute that we have, we have about a minute and a half left, Nancy, but I wanted to ask you a slightly different final question, which is where do we go from here? What should we be focusing on when it comes to student voting and civic engagement? Can you give us some final thoughts on that? Sure. Well, one thing that I think we see right now is tremendous student leadership. And that is great news. You know, this idea that campuses should be spirited and, and uh, 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 sort of electrifying places around elections, I, that's just got to happen. And students do it the best. They are the best at mobilizing each other. The problem with students is they leave. And so where we need to be focusing our energies is with the people they leave behind, the administrators, the staff, and the faculty. And the systemic changes that we need have to be in the behaviors of those groups because they don't leave quite as frequently and they can do things that become part of the DNA of an organization, part of what's in the water. We can change the way we teach. We can change the way um, the priorities of the academic side of the house. We can bolster civic learning across the curriculum. Civic learning is needs to be embedded in every discipline. So with those, uh, you know, that's where we are focusing our energies. We're really looking at, at, at to Al Nor's point, the ecosystem. Uh, we are working with national associations all uh, down in Washington, and that spreads out everywhere. And what we're really going for is a large scale systemic shift in what higher education believes its priorities to be. I couldn't end on a more poignant and perfect note, Nancy. Thank you so very much for that presentation and for that question and answer session. I think all three of these show um, the systemic change that Tufts is trying to make. So thank you very much. And before we thank end, you. I'd like to, to invite Peter Dolan, chairman of Tufts Board of Trustees to make a few closing remarks. Thank you, Tim, Alnor, and Nancy for sharing your important research. And to Kaylan for being our first online Tufts Talks host. I look forward to Tufts Talks every year the event reminds us how important teaching and research are to the vitality of our university. And tonight's speakers exemplify the remarkable talent we have. They also embody the spirit of Tufts as an engine for good in the world. As alumni and friends of this great university, you fuel this engine through your ongoing support, creating more opportunities for innovation and discovery every day, and enabling Tufts to reach new heights as a student-centered research university. We can all be proud that USAID recently selected Tufts University 
to lead the $100 million Strategies to Prevent Spillover Program to reduce viral zoonotic disease outbreaks. This selection of Tufts is an endorsement of our expertise and commitment to convening highly effective One Health teams to address global threats, a commitment that's more important now than ever. Three years ago, we publicly launched our Brighter World campaign to raise $1.5 billion in support of research, faculty, and financial aid for students across the university. Thanks to the support of 112,000 donors, the campaign has raised more than $1 billion to date. Your generosity had made possible the creation of 47 new professorships, including an endowed professorship held by one of our presenters tonight, Tim Griffin. Endowed professorships are a prestigious career distinction and a signal to existing and future faculty that Tufts places a high value on teaching and research. More than 40% of campaign contributions are in support of these priorities. And your generosity has helped us raise over $220 million to support future jumbos through scholarships and financial aid, allowing Tufts to fulfill its promise to meet 100% of the financial need of every undergraduate student we admit for their entire four years, even if their circumstances change during that time. This allows Tufts to attract and admit the most qualified applicants from all backgrounds and provide them with exceptional transformative experiences. Consider the first year undergraduate class of 2024. More than 10% are the first in their family to attend college. Women account for a slight majority in the School of Engineering and 50% are students of color. While we've made advances in this area, we still have more work to do. I also want to encourage you to share what you've learned tonight with other alumni, friends, and family so they know about the groundbreaking work that Tufts is doing to make the world brighter and will be inspired to join you in making it possible. Thank you for joining me in our collective commitment to Tufts research, faculty, and students, and for being here tonight. I look forward to seeing many of you in person again soon. Until then, be safe and be well. I turn you back to Kaylon for final thoughts. Thank you, Peter. And thank you, Tony and Nadine. And a big thank you to Tim, Alnor, and Nancy for joining me live tonight for a special presentation of Tufts Talks. We are grateful for everything you are doing. And most important, thank you, alumni, parents, students, faculty, staff, and friends for being with us and supporting our work. I invite you to return to the Tufts Talks website at tuftstalks.tufts edu to explore these topics in more depth and to find out how you can get involved. You'll also find recordings you can download and listen to if there's anything you missed or would like to hear again. Until we are able to be together again, be well and good night.